How's it going everyone? So in my last video I talked a little bit about quadratic mean diameter or basically the average diameter in a forest and I said that if you're managing a forest and the average stem diameter is decreasing over time then I don't think that that forestry operation can be considered sustainable. So what I wanted to do is kind of talk about why I view it that way because I think we are headed into a sort of epochal shift in the markets and this is going to be crucial to understand moving forward. Now um, one thing and I've talked about this before but one thing we have to understand is that sustainability is kind of a tricky concept to pin down. Uh, what, what do we mean by sustainability? Are we talking about just pure mathematical sustainability? We're harvesting what we grow or are we talking about you know multifaceted sustainability? Are we economically sustainable? Are we, of course, ecologically sustainable? And to be truly sustainable, I think you really have to be sustainable on all fronts. When the quadratic mean diameter is decreasing, then I think we become unsustainable on the economic front. So when those average diameters are decreasing, what that means in practice is that the landowner is shortening the rotation age. Now the rotation age is uh, the time in between the seedling stage and the harvest stage. So basically it's the lifespan of a tree or the lifespan of a stand. If we are shortening the rotation age, we are harvesting earlier than the biological maximum. So the tree might still be able to grow, but we're making the decision to harvest it earlier than its max size. So on a certain level, that's kind of insane. If a tree is still growing, why would we cut it down? After all, we're trying to grow wood products. We're, we're growing timber, we're growing forests. So why would we not just let these trees continue growing? And that's something that's kind of just taken for granted in the forest industry, but it actually requires a lot of justification. Now there are some nuances with like the quality of timber, you know, after a certain point, a tree might to become worse in quality and its nominal value might begin to decline or it might start to rot, something like that. But generally speaking, uh, the reason we do this, the reason we don't wait until a tree reaches its maximum size to harvest is something called the time value of money. Money that we have today is worth more than money we have in the future. The way we quantify this is by discounting future revenues to the present using a discount rate. So if my discount rate is 7%, that representing what I can get from an alternative investment, then you know maybe $500 I have 10 years from now is only worth $250 today if we discount it back at 7%. I don't know what the exact math works out to, but it should be around there. Now, one thing we have to recognize this, which is something that I don't think a lot of people really recognize or properly recognize, is that because this is based on the idea of opportunity cost, this is a very abstract concept. And that's kind of crazy because it really is the basis of a lot of forest management. I mean, basically nobody is growing trees to the complete maturity. And so why aren't we doing that? The answer is based on this extremely abstract concept of opportunity cost. And you might say, well, opportunity cost isn't abstract. Like if I'm doing something, I'm inherently giving up the opportunity to do something else. But it is abstract and you yourself don't fully believe in the idea. And the proof of that is the fact that you are watching this video. Now, most of my videos end up being about 15 minutes long. So let's say it's, it's gonna end up being that long. Um, if you make $40 per hour and you instead decide to watch this 15 minute video, you are sacrificing $10 to watch this video. Now, I know that if I put this video behind a paywall and charge $10, my views would be zero. Absolutely none of you would pay that. So the fact that you are watching this, and I'll get you know at least a thousand views probably, shows that basically nobody sees themselves as sacrificing $10 to watch this video. That's kind of silly. So even though we can all kind of agree conceptually that opportunity cost is real, basically nobody acts like it's real. Um, so it is an extremely abstract concept. So if we all understand that, the next question becomes, what rate do we use? And that's where it gets very tricky. Do we use 2%? 4%? Believe it or not, in industrial sources, you will even see 8%, which is absolutely insane. Anybody who uses 8% to discount uh, future revenues from forestry, they have no idea what they're talking about, and I will fight you on that. Now, here is a thought experiment to understand how to choose a proper discount rate. Why not just use 50% because that's what you can get at a roulette table? Now, we all know why that's stupid. 
the 50% return at a roulette table could also be a 100% loss. So we're comparing completely different risk profiles and it, it just doesn't work that way. We have to be comparing it to an alternative investment that has a rate of return that we can one, actually get, it can't just be some theoretical rate that doesn't actually exist, and two, has a similar risk. And that is the real question. Now I've talked about this before, but forest land is extremely unique in its individual risks. It's a real asset. It doesn't have any counterparty risk, meaning it's, it's not based on a contract. Uh, it actually is a productive asset. It produces a dividend because it grows timber and its value is not technically contingent on its productivity. So uh, whereas with farmland or an apartment building, those assets have to remain productive in order to retain their value, otherwise they degrade. Timberland just grows and it does have bare land value. So it really is like gold, but it's like gold that produces little baby golds because of that production. So what alternative investment is there that is like gold that produces little baby golds? Those aren't very common. Now I've thought about it a lot and the best answer I can come up with is the 10 year yield on TIPS, Treasury Inflation Protected Securities. Now TIPS are essentially bonds where the principle of the bond uh, actually increases with the rate of inflation. So it's inflation protected. So whatever the rate of the TIPS is, is above and beyond the rate of inflation or at least the CPI rate of inflation. Um, and that's important to understand because forest land, you know, a lot of people talk about timberland sequestering carbon. No, uh, that's, that's in most cases pretty silly. What forest land really sequesters is uh, moronic monetary policy. Both the land and the timber have a tendency to rise with the rate of inflation. Um, so we do have these very similar mechanics where the principle rises with inflation. But there is another crucial similarity that I think is interesting. Um, when tips increase with the rate of inflation, you are actually taxed on the increase in principal. So if inflation one year is 10% and the principal of the bond increases 10%, you are taxed on that additional amount. So it's an asset that has this built-in wealth tax, much like property taxes. The biggest difference is that with forest land, it's very illiquid, it's hard to sell. Uh, but with the bonds, even though they're basically cash, you have counterparty risk, which in this case, uh, you might actually call CPI fraud risk. So uh, if you follow these things, if, if your mom took too much Tylenol during pregnancy and you follow these things, uh, the latest tips auctions have been pretty bad. And I think the reason for that is because people are starting to catch on that there is a fraud risk associated with the, the rate of inflation, the CPI print. And um, that is a form of counterparty risk. That's also likely one of the reasons why gold is skyrocketing, finally. Now of those two things, liquidity risk and counterparty risk, I really think counterparty risk is much worse. In fact, I think there's an argument to be made that there really is no such thing as liquidity risk in a certain context. Uh, for example, one of the justifications for owning a home is the idea that it's a forced savings account. So if liquidity risk is really that bad, it's kind of weird that it's touted as one of the benefits of uh, one of the largest investments that most people make. So what is the rate on 10 year tips? What is the discount rate we should use? Well, currently, uh, the 10 year this morning, I'm looking at it here, it's sitting at 1.7%. But importantly, uh, there was a 10 year period in the wake of the financial crisis where they averaged 0% spending considerable time in negative territory. Now, what happens if you are discounting future revenues at 0%? Well, the answer is there is no such thing as the time value of money. You just work in nominal terms and you keep trees on the stump until a day before they die, or at least until they start to degrade. Now, was any industrial forestry outfit keeping trees on the stump until a day before they died in the wake of the financial crisis? No, absolutely not. In fact, a lot of them started harvesting fairly aggressively. The people who were extending rotation ages during that time were primarily conservation organizations not really interested in economics. So what we know is that for the vast majority of these industrial operators, whether it was explicit or implicit, even within their own boardrooms, they were using a discount rate above the, the natural rate, the 10 year tips, as I would argue. Because again, this is abstract, so all we can do is make arguments. So 
For every basis point, that's 0.01% for those of you who sleep well, for every basis point increase, we are moving towards that 50% roulette example. On a very micro scale, we are increasing the risk of our investment. We are increasingly gambling with every increase in that discount rate. And this is true on the technical level, but it can take different forms. So, um, you know, on the, I guess, explicit level, if you are taking your money, you're harvesting your trees and taking that money and then going to the casino with it, then you're explicitly increasing the risk of your capital base. You are putting it into a riskier investment. But it also happens more subtly. Uh, if you're saying, for example, as some people say, you have to be running your forest at 8%, well then what that likely means is that you're making a lot of plantations. And that is going to be a much riskier investment than just owning forest land more passively. Planting trees, you're taking capital and you're putting it directly into the land and you can lose that actual capital. It's not just an opportunity cost like it might be if you were just letting trees grow and then you lost some to insects. Uh, no, you're actually losing your capital base. But here's where it gets interesting. Even if you have a lower discount rate that you're using, and let's say you want it to be 4%, whereas the 10-year yield is 1.7. Well, what you might be doing then, this is where it comes back to QMD, is you're just shortening your rotation ages because the sooner you get money, uh, the, the less it's discounted. So the difference between money discounted at 5% 20 years into the future uh, versus 40 is pretty huge. That's half the amount of time it's being discounted at that 5% rate. So the earlier you can get a return on your money, the uh, larger the discount rate can be or rather I should say, the larger the internal rate of return. So what happens, and this is really the meat and potatoes of my argument here, what happens as our mean diameter is shrinking? Well, the first thing it's doing is increasing our cost of harvest. It takes more movements to get less yield. And I've actually experimented with that firsthand um, doing my harvest. The second thing it's doing is it's taking your forest products and it's moving them all into um, lower value and more unstable product classes. So, I mean, the obvious example of this would be pulpwood. Uh, pulpwood is a very low-grade market. It's extremely volatile. And so if you're growing small wood that can only be sold as pulpwood, um, obviously all of your forest products are extremely volatile, um, even more liquid. That can be a problem. But even for saw logs, this can happen. You know, veneer, the highest grade of saw log, uh, is, is the largest class of saw log. You can't have small veneer logs. But also with you know, a five inch diameter softwood saw log, you're going to be able to get uh, fewer products from that log than you would be able to with a larger softwood saw log. So for example, a large spruce tree like this right here, um, you, know, you could be able to get obviously two by fours, two by sixes, two by eights, even two by tens, although I'm not sure what the demand for two by tens is these days. Or you could cut it all into two by fours, or maybe you could get shiplap, uh, or maybe, maybe this could even be a purlin log. Who knows? You have a lot of optionality with a tree this size. With a five inch diameter tree, yeah, technically that's a saw log, but you're only gonna get some two by fours out of it. That's it, nothing else. You have no optionality. So even within the context of being a quote unquote higher grade market, like it's not pulp wood, um, you're reducing your optionality and increasing the risk of your standing timber. You are exposing yourself to market risk. Now, what are the two most common things we hear about in the forest products market? The first thing is a labor shortage. Now, a labor shortage is just increasing labor cost, right? Because it's a shortage at that price point. So if these companies were paying $300 per hour, there would be no shortage. Hell, even I would jump in a grapple skitter for that much. And that's kind of a touchy subject because margins are already being squeezed pretty hard um, but I mean, honestly, in, in the modern era for the amount of risk a logging contractor takes on and for the hours they work, I mean, uh, they, they better be taking home 150 to 200 K to really make that worthwhile. And I think we like to pretend like it's a cultural problem. And I mean, to a degree it is, but, um, you can overcome all problems with, with just more money. And, uh, yeah, so that's that. So good luck paying a guy enough if he's harvesting this. And with low grade markets, well, that kind of speaks for itself. That's kind of been the gripe of the industry for the last 25 years. If you go to any forestry convention, there's bound to be a lot of talk about finding new low grade markets. 
Um, now, honestly, we probably have more diversified low-grade markets than we've ever had. Nominally, they're worth less because they're not as profitable as paper was. <clears throat> but just in terms of the types of products you can get, I'd argue we probably have more than we've ever had. Um, so that, that's not going to fix anything. In my opinion, it really is a problem of too many of these trees being in low-grade classes. And I don't think that's going to be fixed by more low-grade markets. So anyway, guys, that's the gist of it. As you shrink down your QMD, that necessarily means that the rate at which you're discounting future revenues is increasing. And with that increase of the discount rate, you are taking on more and more risk with your asset, which is going to lead to economic um, unsustainability when there is economic shocks and tremors, which I think is happening right now. Um, so something to keep in mind, something to think about. Uh, yeah, there's a lot going on right now and uh, it'll be very interesting to see how it goes, but I think we're gonna see some pretty big shifts in the forest, forest markets in the next, you know, 10 years at the latest, but probably within the next five. So anyway. But all you can really do is keep managing your forests. So check out Silvicultural. We have a mapping application that gives you all the imagery and data you would need to analyze and delineate and manage your forest. So we have the color infrared imagery. We have the uh, LiDAR canopy height model. We have LiDAR hillshade, slope models, um, full mapping functionality. And with each polygon, it has a built-in inventory system. So you can calculate the inventory with some basic cruise points that any novice landowner can learn and then project the growth from there. And of course, there's Forester AI to give you AI forestry advice based on a custom knowledge base of forestry text. So uh, even I use it all the time. It's, it's the best source out there. I can say that with full faith. Go check it out because for the price, there is nothing better out there and I will catch you later.